This short video is going to be used to explain the process of building this graph that you're seeing on the page here. So I'm going to build a graph that has a series of squares. The squares are going to be based off of the series of numbers. I'm going to calculate the relative value of each of those. So each number is going to be, represent a percentage of the sum of all the numbers. So if I take these seven numbers, add them together, I get a total value and then divide each of those numbers in turn by that total, you get a percentage that makes them relative to each other. So this is what we're going to build here. This is the finished version that you're seeing. Now, coming back into Dreamweaver, um, you can see I've got the standard CSS for the canvas just to put the dashed border around it. Um, you don't have to use a dashed border. That's just something that I've been doing. We've got a canvas tag with the ID graph that we'll reference in our JavaScript and then we have our script. Now usually you would put this script in an external file. I've just kept it inside here so that there's one file to upload. Um, I will have this online for you to use so you can download the the source code when this is all done. Alright so the beginning of our script I have a global variable called values and these are my seven values. So the smallest is 5, biggest is 77, all those numbers. I'm using the add event listener, which is the latest version of how you would add an event to an object. I'm using DOM content loaded. Instead of load, the load event waits for absolutely everything. So it waits for scripts, it waits for CSS, it waits for images, it waits for videos. Everything has to be loaded in the page before the on load event fires. DOM content loaded is the standard JavaScript equivalent of the jQuery ready event. The only limitation to this is that in Internet Explorer it's only version 9 and up that supports it. So if you have to support IE8 or IE7 you'll have to fall back on the on load or do some other script yourself. So I'm waiting for my content to be loaded on the page and then I'm calling the function build chart which is right here. Now I have the data inside the same file right here, the values of the array. If I were using Ajax to fetch it inside build chart, that's where I would make my Ajax call and then it would in turn have a got data function and that's where I would put all the rest of the script is inside that next function. I need to wait until I have the data before I actually build the chart. So var total equals zero, we do our standard loop and we're just going through the array from zero to the length of the array and I'm adding each value independently into the total. So at the very end of it, total is going to be the sum of all these values. We have our canvas variable, it's just a reference to the HTML canvas tag. Context is the drawing surface inside the canvas. Num, punt, num points, rather, is the number of items in this array, values. Padding is the amount of space I've decided that I want to place um, in between each of the squares. I'm also going to use it on the left and right of the canvas surface to create some space between the edges. So, after creating that value for start, We've got some variables here for the color. I'm just going to use the same color for all of them just to keep this simple. Fill style, I'm going to use that color. Stroke style is the lines outside of the squares. I'm going to use a dark charcoal gray for that. I'm going to keep the lines for the squares at one pixel thick. And then the rendering area, what we're going to do is each square is going to occupy a space on the canvas. I don't want to have all the squares squished together. I don't want them going from edge to edge. I want to have space between each one, and I want to have spaces on the left and right. So to figure out um, how much space I'm going to have on the canvas to use, I'm going to calculate that. So I'll take the width of the canvas minus the 20 pixels. I'm going to use 10 on the left, 10 on the right, and then I'm also going to subtract all the space that's inside, or rather in between, each of the squares that I'm going to draw. 
So this is the amount of space I'm left over with. If I took off the left and right, if I took off the space between each of the squares, what's left, I'm going to use that remaining space as what I have to draw on, and I'm going to calculate the size of each of those squares relative to that amount of space. All right, so we go inside of our loop and calculate the percentages. Take each value, divide it by total. That gives me that um, percentage for the first, then the second, then the third value inside that array. I'm going to now calculate how long I want each side of each square to be. So I'm working right now with the very first square. And I'm going to take that rendering area, which was all the space I'm going to use to draw the squares. And I'm going to multiply that by my percentage. And that's going to tell me how big the first square is, then how big the second one, then the third, then the fourth. So it's not the entire width of the canvas that I'm doing a percentage of. It's just after I remove all the padding, whatever I have left, that's what I'm going to do a percentage of, just so I don't end up going off the right edge of the canvas. OK, so we have our, render, our side figured out how long it's going to be. Then we're going to just use the standard commands for drawing. So context, begin path. Context, rect. And first we put in the x and y values. So this is the uh, top left corner of our square. Start. You can see up at the top, we used padding, which is 10 pixels in. So that's the first one, 10 pixels in and 10 pixels down. And I'm going to use this value for every one of the squares. I'm going to keep them aligned to the top edge. So it's going to be 10 pixels down from the top all the way across. Then we have to give the width and the height. Well, that's our side variable. Since we're going to use squares, we know that the width and height is the exact same. Once that's done, I will call fill and stroke to put the color inside and the line around. So I can test this right now. It will draw squares. They will just happen to be over top of each other. Oh, I'm missing something here. And we've got the begin path, the rect, fill, stroke. Well, we're going to want to change the starting value. Oh, I may as well put this in here while I'm reading through the code. So the start value for each one of these squares, it's going to change for each one. First one's going to be at 10, 10. Then the next one is going to be 10, 10. So the x value is 10, plus the length of the side, plus the padding that goes in between each of the squares. here. Okay, there it is. So padding times num point, this should be points, plural. All right. And there we have it. So this corner right here, this is 10 over, 10 down. And then this one starts at start plus side plus padding. And then the next one's going to be at start plus side plus padding. Start plus side plus padding. So each time we go through this, we're moving forward. And we use that same variable called side, or sorry, start, as the previous starting point. So we just have to add to that the length of its side plus that same 10, 10 pixels padding that we're putting between each of them. So this is always the starting point. I'm putting 10 pixels down from the top as the same for each one. Let's say we wanted to go on a, a diagonal. So I'm going to replace 10 with y. We'll create a variable up here called y, and we'll set that equal to 10. So we could conceivably just put y in there. If I save that and I refresh the page, nothing's changed. 
However, if I were to add 10 to the value of y, I'm doing that inside my loop. So each time I'm going through, it's adding 10, adding 10, adding 10. So I'm going to get a diagonal across the stage. There, you can see it's kind of cascading down here. It's 10 pixels down further each time. We can make that a bigger jump, 20 or 30. There we go. You can see it's cascading down by 30 each time. And you can play with these numbers. There's nothing saying it has to be a fixed amount. So maybe it's going to be times 30 times percentage. So the amount it jumps down is going to be based on its own percentage. The bigger the number, the further the jump. So I could even knock this up and say it's 100. So a percentage of 100 pixels for each time. The bigger the number, the bigger the jump. So this one's got a little, this one's small, so it's a little jump. This one's bigger, so it's a bigger jump. Not quite as big as the previous one. This one's big, so this jump right here is going to be bigger than the previous one. This one jumps down less than this one. This is tiny, so there's a very little drop right here. So you can see the uh, amount of cascade is going to be determined by the percentage as well. And you can do lots of different things. You can use the percentage to calculate widths, heights, colors, font sizes, all kinds of things. Anything you want. As long as you've got a percentage, you can apply that. You can apply it to rotation. We could, uh, yeah, we could do that right in here. Context dot rotate. And then we can provide an angle in here that we want. So let's say we're going to say var angle equals our percentage times math.pi times 2. So a percentage of the whole circle. And we're rotating the entire stage, the entire canvas. Each time we do this, it's going to do some weird things to our placement. Oh, OK, I've got to put the angle inside here. So you can see they're scattered all over because we're rotating the entire stage. If I wanted to keep them going along that same line, let's say I, I go back and I'm always going to keep them at 10, and I want to do this rotation, but I don't want the entire stage to rotate every time so they're not following that straight line, what I will do is I will save the context and then rotate, place the thing, and then go back, set it back to what it was previously. So context dot save remembers where the zero zero point is. It remembers the amount of rotation. Then we rotate. We draw the rectangle, and then at the very end, before we start the next square, I will restore. So that puts the points back where they were. So we can see more of the uh, squares coming up now because we're not doing as much of a rotation. We're rotating once, going back, rotating once, going back. So the amount that these things are being rotated has to do with the percentage. This one, you can see, is rotated very little. This one is rotated even less. The bigger the square, the further it's rotated away from that line. We could, uh, if we wanted, make this less of an effect by, in addition to the rotation, we can also translate. And we can make this top left corner of the square. That can become the 0, 0 point. If we added translate into our mix here. So let's say we will do context.translate to change the 0, 0 point. And that's going to become the start 10 location then we're always going to use 0, 0 as our starting point. There we go. But it does cover up. So we are moving over so that we've got the correct coordinates. 
these are being rotated according to their percentage. Uh, it's hard to tell with squares because once you get past 90 degrees or half pi radians, then it looks like it's square again. It looks like it's level against that line. And with the little tiny ones, like you can see, here's the 5 and the 2 is underneath here. They are getting covered by the rotation. But that's just to give you guys some uh, possible examples, things that you can experiment with. Hopefully this uh, has helped you understand how to walk through the logic of deciding where to draw, when to draw, how to use the save, translate, rotate, and restore commands, and how to calculate uh, widths and starting positions using percentages.